the mysterious biped. Just before Christmas, 1887, a young Dutch doctor with an un-Dutch name, Marie Eugene Francoise Thomas Dubois, arrived in Sumatra in the Dutch East Indies with the intention of finding the earliest human remains on Earth. Several things were extraordinary about this. To begin with, no one had ever gone looking for ancient human bones before. Everything that had been found to this point had been found accidentally, and nothing in the, in the uh, Dubois background suggested that he was the ideal candidate to make this pro process intentional. He was an anatomist by training with no background in paleontology, nor there was any special reason to suppose that the East Indies would hold early remains. Logic dictated that if an ancient people were to be found at all, it would be on a large and long populated landmass and not in the com comparative fastness of an archipelago, Dubois had driven to the East Indies on nothing stronger than a hunch, the availability of employment, and the knowledge that Sumatra was full of caves, the environment in which the most important hominid fossils had so far been found. What is most extraordinary in all this nearly miraculous reality, really, is that he found what he was looking for. At the time, Dubois conceived his plan to search for a missing link. The human fossil record consisted of very little. Five incomplete Neanderthal skeletons, one partial jawbone of uncertain provenance, and a half a dozen Ice Age humans recently found by railway, railway workers in a cave at a cliff called Cro-Magnon in France. Of all the Neanderthal specimens, the best preserved was sitting unremarked on a shelf in London. It had been found by workers blasting rock from a quarry in Gibraltar in 1848, so its preservation was a wonder, but unfortunately no, no one yet appreciated what it was. After being briefly described at a meeting at the Gibraltar Scientific Society, it had been sent to the Hunterian Museum in London where it remained undisturbed for an occasional light dusting for over a half a century. The first formal description of it wasn't written until 1907, and then by a geologist named William Solis with only a passing competency in anatomy. So instead, the name and credit for the discovery of the first early humans went to the Neander Valley in Germany not unfitting as it happens for an uncanny coincidence neander for an uncanny coincidence neander in greek means new man there in 1856 workmen in another quarry in a cliff face overlooking the dussel river found some curious looking bones which they passed to a local school teacher knowing he had an interest in all things natural to his great credit the teacher, Johann Karl Fuhlroth, saw that he had some new type of human, though quite what it was and how special would be a matter of dispute for some time. Many people refused to accept that the Neanderthal bones were ancient at all. August Mayer, a professor at the University of Bonn and a man of influence, insisted that the bones were merely though those of a Mongolian Cossack soldier who had been wounded while fighting in Germany in 1814, and had crawled into the cave to die. Hearing of this, T.H. Huxley in England dryly observed how remarkable it was that the soldier, though mortally wounded, had climbed 60 feet up a cliff, divested himself as, of his clothing and personal effects, sealed the cave opening, and buried himself under two feet of soil. Another anthropologist puzzling over Neanderthal's heavy brow ridge suggested that it was the result of long-term frowning arising from a poorly healed forearm fracture. It was against this background that Dubois began his search for ancient human bones. He did no digging himself, but instead used 50 convicts <coughs> lent by the Dutch authorities.
For a year, they worked on Sumatra, then transferred to Java. And there, in 1891, Dubois, or rather his team for Dubois Hill himself, seldom visited the sites, found a section of ancient human cranium now known as the Trinil skull cap. Though only part of a skull, it showed that the owner had had distinctly non-human features and a much, but a much larger brain than an ape. It quickly became popularized as Java Man. Today we know it as Homo erectus. The next year, <clears throat> Dubois' workers found a virtually complete thigh bone and looked surprisingly modern. In fact, many anthropologists think it is modern. It has nothing to do with Java Man. If it is an erectus bone, it is unlike any other found since. Nonetheless, Dubois used the thigh bone to deduce, correctly as it turned out, that Pithecanthropus walked upright. He also produced, with nothing but a scrap of cranium in one tooth, a model of the complete skull, which also proved to be uncannily accurate. In 1895, Dubois returned to Europe expecting a triumphal reception. In fact, he met nearly the opposite reaction. Most scientists disliked both of his conclusions and the arrogant manner in which he presented them. The skull cap, they said, was that of an ape, probably a gibbon, and not of any early human. Hoping to bolster his case in 1897, Dubois allowed a respected anatomist from the University of Strasbourg, Gustav Schwalbe, to make a cast of the skull cap. To Dubois' dismay, Schwalbe thereupon produced a monograph that received far more sympathetic attention than anything Dubois had written and followed with a lecture tour in which he was celebrated nearly as warmly as if he had dug up the skull himself. Appalled and embittered, Dubois withdrew into an undistinguished position as a professor of geology at the University of Amsterdam and for the next two decades refused refused to let anyone examine his precious fossils again. He died in 1940, a very unhappy man. Meanwhile, in a half a world away, in late 1924, Raymond Dart, the Australian-born head of anat anatomy at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, was sent a small but unremarkably, but remarkably complete skull of a child with an intact face, a lower jaw, and what is known as an endocast, a natural cast of the brain from a limestone quarry on the edge of the Kalahari Desert at a dusty place called Tong. Dart could see at once that the Tong skull was not of a Homo erectus, like the Dubois Java man, but from an earlier, more ape-like creature. He placed its age at two million years and dubbed it Australo, pardon me if I mispronounce this, Australopithecus, or Southern Ape Man of Africa. In report to Nature, the magazine, Dart called Tong remains amazingly human and suggested the need for an entirely new family, the man apes, to accommodate the find. The authorities were even less favorably disposed to Dart than they had been to Dubois. Nearly everything about his theory, indeed nearly everything about Dart, it appears annoyed them. First, he had proved himself lamentably presumptuous by conducting the analysis himself rather than calling on the help of more worldly experts in Europe. Even his chosen name, Australopithecus, showed a lack of scholarly application combining, as it did, Greek and Latin roots. Above all, his conclusions flew in the face of accepted wis wisdom. Humans and apes, it was agreed, had split apart at least 15 million years ago in Asia. If humans had arisen in Africa, why, that would make us negroid, for goodness sake. It was, if somebody, it was rather as if somebody working today were to announce that he had found the ancestral bones of humans, say, in Missouri. It just didn't fit with what was known. Darl's sole, Dart's sole supporter of note was Robert Broom, a Scottish-born physician and paleontologist of considerable intellect 
and cherishably eccentric nature. It was Broom's habit, for instance, to do his field work naked when the weather was warm, which was often. He was often know, also known for conducting dubious anato anatomical experiments on his poorer and more tractable patients. When the patients died, which was also often, he would sometimes bury their bodies in his back garden to dig up for later study. <clears throat> Broom was an accomplished paleontologist, and since he was also a resident in, in South Africa, he was able to examine the tong skull at first hand. He could see at once that it was as important as Dart supposed and spoke out vi vigorously on Dart's behalf, but to no effect. For the next 50 years, the received wisdom was that the Tong child was an ape and nothing more. Most textbooks didn't even mention it. Dart spent five years working up a monograph, but could find no one to publish it. For years, the skull, today recognized as one of the supreme treasures of anthropology, sat as a paperweight on a colleague's desk. At the same time Dart made his announcement in 1924, only four categories of ancient hominid were known, but all that was about to change in a very big way. First, in China, <clears throat> a gifted Canadian amateur named Davidson Black began to poke around at a place, Dragon Bone Hill, that was locally famous as a hunting ground for old bones. Unfortunately, rather than preserving the bones for study, the Chinese ground them up to make medicines. We can only guess how many priceless Homo erectus bones ended up as a sort of Chinese equivalent of bicarbonate of soda. The site had been much denuded by the time Black arrived, but he found a single fossilized molar, and on the basis of that alone, quite brilliantly announced the discovery, which quickly became Peking Man. At Black's urging, more determined excavations were under, undertaken and many other bones found. Unfortunately, all were lost the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 when a contingent of U.S. Marines trying to spirit the bones and themselves out of the country was inter intercepted by the Japanese and imprisoned. Seeing that their crates held nothing but bones, the soldier, Japanese soldiers left them at the roadside and that was the last ever seen of those bones. In the meantime, back on Dubois' old turf of Java, a team led by Ralph von Koenigswald had found another group of early humans which became known as the Solo people from the site of their discovery on the Solo River in Dangong, Dong. In the following years, as more bones were found and identified, there came a flood of new names, nearly all involving a new genus type as well as a new species. By the 1950s, the number of named hominid types had risen to comfortably over 100. To add to the confusion, individual forms often went by a succession of different names as paleo paleoanthropologists refined, reworked, and squabbled over classifications. Solo people were known variously, and finally, just plain Homo erectus. In an attempt to introduce some order, in 1960, Clark Howell of the University of Chicago, following the suggestions of Ernst Mayer and others of the previous decade, proposed cutting the number of genera to just two, Australopithecus and Homo, and rationalizing many of the species. The Java and Peking man, men both became Homo erectus, and for a time, order prevailed in the world of hominids. It didn't last. After about a decade of comparative calm, paleoanthropology embarked on another period of swift and prolific discovery, which hasn't abated yet. In the 1960, in 1960s, produced Homo habilis, thought by some to be the missing link between apes and humans, but thought by others not to be a separate species at all. At all. Altogether, some 20 types of hominid are recognized in the literature today. Unfortunately, almost no two experts recognize the same 20. 
There is no central authority that rules on these things. The only way a name becomes accepted is by consensus, and there's often very little of that. A big part of the problem, paradoxically, is shortage of evidence. Since the dawn of time, several billion human or human-like beings have lived, each contributing a little genetic variability to the total human stock. Out of this vast number, the whole of our understanding of human prehistory is based on the remains, often exceedingly fragmentary, of perhaps 5,000 individuals. You could fit all in the back of a pickup truck if you didn't mind how you jumbled everything up. Ian Tattersall said, the bearded and friendly curator of anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He replied when I asked him the size of the total world ar archive of hominid and early bo human bones. The shortage wouldn't be so bad if the bones were distributed evenly through time and space, but of course they are not. They appear randomly, often in the most tantalizing fashion. <clears throat> Homo erectus walked the earth for over well over a million years and it inhabited territory from the Atlantic edge of Europe to the Pacific side of China. Yet if you brought back to life every Homo erectus individual whose existence we can vouch for, they wouldn't fill a school bus. Homo habilis consisted of even less, just two partial skeletons and a number of isolated limb bones. Something as short-lived as our own civilization would almost certainly not be known for the fossil record at all. It is the patchiness of the record that makes each new find look so sudden and distinct from all the others. If we had tens of thousands of skeletons distributed at regular intervals through the historical record, there would be appreciably more degrees of shading. Whole new species don't emerge instantaneously, as the fossil record implies, but gradually out of other existing species. The closer you go back to the point of divergence, the closer the similarities are, so that it becomes exceedingly difficult and sometimes impossible to distinguish a late Homo erectus from an early Homo sapiens, since it is likely to be both or neither. Similar disagreements can also arise over the question of identification from fragmentary remains, deciding, for instance, whether a particular bone represents a female Austral Australopithecus boisa or a ho male Homo habilis. With so little to be certain about, scientists often have to make assumptions based on other objects found nearby, and these may be little more than valiant guesses. As Alan Walker and Pat Shipman have dryly observed, <clears throat> if you correlate tool discovery with the species of creatures off, most often found nearby, you would have to conclude that early hand tools were made mostly by antelopes. Perhaps nothing better typifies the confusing, confusing bundle of conduction that was Homo habilis. Simply put, habilis bones made no sense. That when arranged in sequence, they show males and females evolving at different rates and in different directions, the males becoming less ape-like and more human with time, while females from the same period appear to be moving away from humanness toward greater apeness. Some authorities don't believe hobbleus is a valid category at all. But those who see hobbleus as an independent species don't agree whether it is of the same genus as us or is it from a side branch that never came to anything. All this leaves ample room for arguments, of course, and nobody likes to argue more than paleoanthropologists. And of all the disciplines in science, paleoanthropology boasts perhaps the largest share of egos, says the authors of Java Man, a book, it may be noted, that itself devotes long, wonderfully unselfconscious passages to attacks on the inadequacies of, other, inadequacies of others. So bearing in mind that there is little you can say about human prehistory that won't be disputed by someone somewhere else, we cert most certainly had one which we think we know what we, had one, what we think we know about who we are and where 
we roughly came from is this. For the first 90.999999% of our history as organisms, we were in the same ancestral line as chimpanzees. Virtually nothing is known about the prehistory of chimpanzees. But whatever they were, we were. Then about seven million years ago, something major happened. A group of new beings emerged from the tropical forests of Africa and began to move about on the open savanna. These were Australopithecines. For the next five million years, they would be the world's dominant hominid species. Austral is Latin for southern and has no connection in this context to Australia. Australopithecines came in several varieties. Some slender and gracile, like Raymond Dart's Tong child, others more sturdy and robust, but all were capable of walking upright. And some of these species existed for well over a million years, others for a modest few hundred thousand. But it is worth bearing in mind that even the least successful had histories many times longer than we have yet achieved. The most famous hominid remains in the world are those of a 3.18 million, million year old Australopithecine found in Ethiopia by a team led by Donald Johansson, formerly known as AL. The skeleton became more familiarly known as Lucy after the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Johansson had never doubted her importance. She is our earliest ancestor, the missing link between ape and human, he has said. Lucy was tiny, just three and a half feet tall. She could walk, though, as well how she could walk, though how well is a matter of some dispute. She was evidently a good climber, too. Much else is unknown. Her skull is almost entirely missing. So little could be said with confidence about her brain size, though skull fragments suggested it was small. Most books about Lucy's skeleton as being 40% complete, although some put it more closer to half, and produced by the American Museum of Natural History, describes Lucy as two-thirds complete. The BBC television series Eight Man actually called it a complete skeleton, well, even while showing it was anything but. Lucy's principal defining attribute was the use of hands and feet ready to deal with a changing world. At all events, rather less is known about Lucy than is generally supposed. It isn't even actually known she was female. Her sex is merely presumed from her diminutive size. <clears throat> Two years after Lucy's discovery at Laetoli in Tanzania, Mary Leakey found footprints left by two individuals from, it is thought, the same family of hominids. The prints had been made by two Australopithecines and had walked through muddy ash following a volcanic eruption. The t um, and the American Museum of Natural History in New York has an absorbing diorama, which records the moment of their passing. The tableau is done with such conviction that it's easy to overlook cons the consideration that virtually everything above the footprints is imaginary. Almost every external aspect of the two figures, degree of hairiness, facial appendages, whether they had human noses or chimp noses, expression, skin color, size and shape of the female's breast is necessarily suppositional. They are assumed to be Australopithecines because there are no other known candidates. Ian, I think, may have made them just slightly more ape-like and less human. These creatures weren't humans. They were bipedal apes. Until very recently, recently it was assumed that we were descended from Lucy and the Latoli creatures, but now many authorities aren't so sure. Although physical features, teeth for instance, suggest a possible link between us, other parts of the Australopithecine anatomy are more troubling. In their book, Extinct Humans, Tattersall and Schwartz point out 
that the upper portion of the human femur is very much like that of the apes, but not the Australopithecines. If so, Lucy is in a direct line with apes and modern humans. It means we must have adopted an Australopithecine femur for a million years and then gone back to an ape femur when we moved on to the next phase of our development. They believe, in fact, that not only was Lucy not our ancestor, she wasn't even much of a walker. Lucy and her kind did not locomote in anything like the modern human fashion. Only when these hominids had to travel between our boreal habitats would they find themselves walking bipedally, forced to do so by their own anatomies. Johansson does not accept this. Lucy's hips and the muscular arrangement of her pelvis would have made it hard for her, as hard for her to climb trees as it is for modern humans. Matters grew murkier still in 2001 and 2002 when four exceptional new specimens were found. One discovered by Maeve Leakey of the famous fossil hunting, fossil hunting family at Lake Turkana in Kenya. It's, it's from about the same time as Lucy and raises the possibility that it was our ancestor and Lucy was an unsuccessful side branch. All these early creatures, and quite primitive, but they walked upright, and they were doing far earlier than previously thought. Bipedalism is a demanding and risky strategy. It means refashioning the pelvis into a full load bearing instrument. To preserve the, the required strength, the birth canal must be comparatively narrow. This has two very significant immediate consequences and one longer term one. <clears throat> First, it means a lot of pain for any birthing mother and a greatly increased danger of fatality to mother and baby both. Moreover, to get the baby's head through such a tight space, it must be born while its brain is still small and while the baby, therefore, is still helpless. This means long-term infant care, which in turn means solid male-female bonding. But stepping out into the open savanna also clearly left the, human, the early hominids much more exposed. An upright hominid could see better, but also could be seen better. Even now, as a species, we are almost preposterously vulnerable in the wild. Nearly every large animal you can care to name is stronger, faster, and toothier than us. Faced with attack, modern humans have only two advantages. We have a good brain, with which we can devise strategies, and we have hands with which we can fling or brandish hurtful objects. We are the only creature that can harm at a distance, and we can thus afford to be physically vulnerable. At one point between two and three million years ago, it appears that there may have been as many as six hominid types coexisting in Africa. Only one, however, was fated to last, Homo which emerged from the mists beginning about two million years ago. No one knows quite the relationship, what the, what the relationship was between Australopithecines and Homo, but what is known is that they coexisted for something over a million years before all the Austro, Australopithecines, robust and grace-like alike, vanished mysteriously and uh, possibly abruptly over a million years ago. No one knows why they disappeared. Perhaps we ate them. Conventionally, the Homo line begins with Homo habilis, a creature about whom we know almost nothing, and concludes with us, Homo sapiens, man the thinker. Homo habilis, or handyman, was named by Louis Leakey and colleagues in 1964, and was so-called because it was the first hominid to use tools albeit very simple ones. It was a fairly primitive creature, much more chimpanzee than human, but its brain was about 50% larger than that of Lucy in gross terms and not much less large proportionately. So it was the Einstein of its day. No persuasive reason has ever been adduced for why hominid brains suddenly began to grow two million years ago. For a long time, it was assumed that big brains and upright walking were directly related, that the movement out of the forest necessitated cunning new strategies that fed off of or promoted braininess. 
So it was something of a surprise after the repeated discoveries of so many bipedal dullards to realize there was no apparent connection between them at all. Tattersall thinks the rise of the big brain may simply have been evolutionary accident. He believes that Stephen Jay Gould, with Stephen Jay Gould, that if you replayed the tape of life, even if you ran it back only a relatively short way to the dawn of hominids, the chances are quite likely that modern humans or anything like them would be here now. One of the hardest ideas for humans to accept, he says, is that we are not the culmination of anything. There is nothing inevitable about our being here. It is part of our vanity as humans that we tend to think of evolution as a process that in fact was programmed to produce us. Even anthropologists tended to think this way right up until the 1970s. Indeed, as recently as 1991, in the popular textbook, The Stages of Evolution, C. Loring Brace stuck doggedly to the linear concept, acknowledging just one evolutionary dead end, the robust Australopithecines. Everything else re represented a straightforward progression, each species of hominid carrying the baton of development so far and then handing it to a younger, fresher runner. Now, however, it seems certain that many of these early forms followed side trails that didn't come to anything. Luckily for us, one did. A group of tool users, which seems to rise out of nowhere and overlap with the shadowy and much dis disputed Homo habilis. This is Homo erectus, the species discovered by Eugene Dubois in Java in 1891. Depending on which sources you consult, it existed from about 1.8 million years ago to possibly as recently as 20,000 or so years ago. According to Java man authors, Homo erectus is the dividing line. Everything that came before him was ape-like and everything came after was human-like. Homo erectus was the first to hunt, the first to use fire, the first to fashion complex tools, the first to leave evidence of campsites, and the first to look after the weak and the frail. Compared with all that had gone before, Homo erectus was extremely human in form as well as behavior. Its members long-limbed and lean, very strong, and with the drive and intelligence to spread successfully over huge areas. To other hominids, Homo erectus must have seemed terrifyingly powerful, fleet, and gifted. Erectus was the velo raptor of its day, according to Alan Walker, one of the world's leading authorities. If you were to look one in the eyes, it might appear superficially to be human, but you wouldn't connect. You'd be a prey. According to Walker, it had a body of an adult human, but the brain of a baby. Although Erectus had been known for almost a century, it was known only from scattered fragments, not enough to come even close to making one full skeleton. So it wasn't until an extraordinary discovery in Africa in the 1980s that its importance, or at the very least possible importance, as a precursor species for modern humans was fully appreciated. In the remote valley of Lake Turkana in Kenya is now one of the world's most productive sites for early human remains. But for a very long time, no one had even thought to look there. It was only because Richard Leakey was on a flight that was diverted over the valley that he realized he, it might be more promising than had been thought. A team was dispatched to investigate and at first found nothing. Then late one afternoon, Kimoya Kimu, Leakey's most renowned fossil hunter, found a small piece of hominid brow on a hill way away, well way away from the lake. Such a sight was unlikely to yield much, but they dug anyway out of respect for Homo erectus skeleton. Out of, uh, uh, sorry, out of respect for chemo's instincts and to their astonishment found a nearly complete Homo erectus skeleton. It was from a boy aged about nine or 12 and had, who had died 1.54 million years ago. The skeleton had an entirely modern body structure, said Tattersall, in a way that was without precedent. The Turkana boy was em very emphatically one of us. Also found at Lake Turkana was a female 1.7 million, million years old, which gave scientists their first clue that Homo erectus 
was more interesting and complex than pre previously thought. The woman's bones were deformed and covered in, a coarse, in coarse growths, the result of an agonizing condition called hypervitaminosis A, which can come only from eating the liver of a carnivore. This, this told us, first of all, that Homo erectus was eating meat. Even more surprising was that the amount of growth showed that she had lived weeks and even months with the disease. Someone had looked after her. It was the first sign of tenderness in hominid evolution. It was also discovered that Homo erectus skulls in the Broca's region, a region of the frontal lobe of the brain, was associated with speech. Chimps didn't have such a feature. Alan Walker thinks the spinal canal didn't have the size and complexity to enable speech that they probably would have communicated about as well as modern chimps. Others, notably Robert Leakey, are convinced they could speak. For a time, it appears, Homo erectus was the only hominid species on Earth. It was hugely adventurous and spread across the globe with what seems to be breathtaking rapidity. The fossil evidence, if taken, if taken literally, suggests that some members of the species reached Java at, at about the same time or even slightly before they left Africa. This has led some hopeful scientists to suggest that perhaps modern people arose not in Africa at all, but in Asia, which would be remarkable, not to say miraculous, as no possible precursor species had ever been found anywhere outside Africa. The Asian hominids would have to appear, have to had to appear, as it were, spontaneously. And anyway, an Asian beginning would merely reverse the problem of their spread. You would still have to explain how the Java people then got to Africa so quickly. What is certain <clears throat> is that sometime well over a million years ago, some new comparatively modern upright beings left Africa and boldly spread out across much of the globe. They did possibly quite rapidly, increasing their range by as much as 25 miles a year on average, all while dealing with mountain ranges, rivers, deserts, and other impediments and adapting to differences in climate and food sources. A particular mystery is how they passed along the west side of the Red Sea, an area of famous, famous punishing aridity now, but even drier in the past. It is a curious irony that the conditions that prompted them to leave Africa would have made it much more difficult to do so now. Yet somehow they managed to find their way around every barrier and to thrive in the lands beyond. That is, I'm afraid, where all the agreement ends. What happened next is the history of human development. In the history of human development is a matter of long and rancorous debate. But it's worth remembering before we move on that all of these evolutionary jostlings over five million years from distant, puzzled Australopithecine to fully modern human produced a creature that is still 98.4% genetically indistinguishable from the modern chimpanzee. There is more difference between a zebra and a horse or between a dolphin and a porpoise than there is between you and the furry creatures your distant ancestors left behind when they set out to take on the world. <laughs>